Hey everyone, it's Marvin. Thanks so much for listening to Books and Boba. Uh, I just wanted to take a quick second to remind you that Books and Boba just launched our Patreon uh, to help support our future endeavors. Rira and I have been running Books and Boba for the last six and a half years, and we've always talked about wanting to do more, um, including expanding our content offerings, um, being able to go to book events, and do more coverage. And so um, to help us get closer to those ambitions, um, we started a Patreon to help us grow and to better support books by Asian and Asian American authors. We are offering two tiers for our Patreon. Um, the first is our regular Boba member coming in at $3 a month, which will give you access to our brand new Books and Boba Discord server so you can engage with your fellow Books and Boba Club members and also Rira and myself in real time. Uh, this is where we'll be aiming to move the bulk of our book club discussions. Uh, but rest assured, we'll still have a presence on Goodreads as well. And our premium tier is our Honey Boba member tier coming in at $5 dollars a month where in addition to access to our discord server you'll also get access to our monthly boba chats a bonus podcast where rira and i and some guests will get together each month and have a a more casual discussion on stuff that may or may not be book related as well as answer some listener q a honey boba members will also have access to a poll to help decide an official books and boba book pick uh, once per quarter so if any of that sounds interesting to you, um, support Books and Boba on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash books and boba. As always, we and I really appreciate your support. All right. Thanks for listening. And I'm on with the show. You're listening to Whoa. Hot Luck. Hot Luck. Hey everyone, welcome to Books and Boba, a book club and podcast featuring books by Asian and Asian American authors. My name is Marvin Yue. And I'm Rira Yu. And it is time for our May 2023 mid-month check-in, our APAM edition. Um, Rira, how is your APAM going? Surprisingly busy, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> But not really related to APM stuff because I'm not really plugged into uh, <laughs> our community events anymore. Yeah, but you're uh, having a pretty good APAM. You've been going to a lot of um, very fun events I've seen on Instagram. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So the reason why we're recording this episode late is because I went to Oakland to go see um, Sugar's concerts because they were the... At first, I could only get tickets through like StubHub for Oakland because it was <laughs> sold out. So I didn't have any tickets for LA, but by luck and through connections, I got sound check for LA. So I got to go to three of his concerts and it was amazing. I saw a couple of author friends there. It was pretty funny because <laughs> um, like I wore like a sunflower headgear for the concerts and like Susan Lee, the author of Soulmates, she was like, I think I saw you because I definitely saw a sunflower like at the L.A. concert. And I was like, yep, that was me. That was me. Yeah. And I saw Marie Lu like coming out of the um, the Kia forum. So I was like, oh, yeah, like lots of authors are BTS fans. I <laughs> keep forgetting about that. I mean, the whole world is a BTS fan at this point. Um. It's mainstream now. I never thought I would see the day, but. <laughs> Here I did are. remember when we ran into Julie too at the Festival of AAPI Books, which um, was a couple of weeks ago at this point in Long Beach. She was saying how your Instagram stories was making her the cool aunt because she has a friend who's going to all these concerts. I mean, I, I have to say, like, Susan Lee is way cooler than me because, um, like, not only has she gone to, like, multiple concerts at multiple stops... Uh, she's in Korea right now. So I'm like watching her Instagram stories <laughs> of her going to all these cool places and hidden cafes in Seoul. And I'm like, how can I grow up to be her? <laughs> we should once we have Susan on the show, I would like to ask her how, you know, she's able to live my dream life of just going to all of these amazing <laughs> places. Yeah, you heard that Susan your, come on our show. Uh, how about your APAM? How has it been so far, Marvin? It's been pretty good. Um, 
semi busy. So the first few weeks was dedicated to the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival, which I am a programmer for. So I had to present a couple films. Uh, we did a whole day at the Gardena um, Cinema, which is one of the last family owned single screen theaters in like LA. It's owned by a Korean American family. Uh, so that was pretty cool. And then we did the Festival of AAPI Books, which was a lot of fun. We got to meet a lot of um, our author friends who were there for panels, including Julie Tu, Suzanne Park, Julie Abe, who is also my niece's favorite author. So I was able to get her to sign a couple of copies for, for my nieces to give me those cool uncle points. So thank you, Julie, for, for being a good sport. Um, yeah, that was actually that was our first ever in-person event as Books and Boba. After six yeah, years, we finally we emerged into the public sphere. <laughs> emerged into into the public. I mean, uh, a couple of listeners stopped by our table and they're like, "Wow, real people behind <laughs> voice behind the voices that I listen to." And I'm like, "Yeah, I mean, you guys are concepts in our mind too. It's kind of weird to <laughs> yeah. to have like this collision of existences." Yeah, but we did get um, people ask us if we were going to other book events. And, you know, that might be in the cards. Um, Apparently, there's a big romance book festival coming up in the summer that um, people told us about, which um, that might be interesting. There's a lot of authors on this list that I've heard of as well, as well as a lot of like Asian American authors. So, you know, maybe. Yeah, Uh, (laughs) and I I do go to a lot of uh, book launch events. It's just you probably don't know what I look like. (laughs) <laughs> Although I did get recognized at uh, one book event, and I was just like, what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have a ton of stickers and bookmarks left over from our events. So from now on, we'll just carry a bunch of them on us. So if you yeah, do I'll recognize us in the wild, me. you get a bookmark with, with our show on it. Congratulations. Yeah. Uh, but it's our, it's our business card, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. What better business card for a book club than a bookmark? Yeah. Um, I guess before we get on with the book news, just want to plug up front because we usually wait till the end. But we did launch a Patreon uh, to support Books and Boba. So if you'd like to become a more active member of our book club, uh, we definitely appreciate any support you can give. Um, we have two tiers, a regular Boba tier at $3 a month and a Honey Boba tier at $5 a month, uh, which will give you special perks, including access to our Books and Boba Discord, uh, where you can interact with me and Rira and fellow book club members in, in real time, as well as uh, for Honey Boba members, you get access to our uh, special Boba Chat episodes um, every month, uh, which this month will be featuring some of the conversations we had at the Festival of AAPI Books with our author friends. So if you're interested in learning more, go to patreon.com slash books and boba. Um, we definitely appreciate any of your support to help us you know, continue growing um, this book club and podcast. Also, for our Honey Boba members, um, remember that you guys have the privilege and honor of choosing our quarterly book month picks. Uh, the first one is coming up. It's coming up in July. Um, so what's going to happen is I'm going to have a list of books uh, that people can choose from. Also, feel free to toss in recommendations, suggestions in our Discord, and I will compile that into a poll and you guys get to pick what we read for july so that is a very good incentive to join (laughs) our honey boba tier because i've had too much control all these years and i would like to have less of it yeah please suggest books (laughs) yeah so if you pick something totally weird um we will read it no matter what it is so yeah come at us (laughs) All right. Uh, with that said, um, this is our mid-month episode. So as always, we will go over the latest book and publishing news in Asian American literature, starting with the latest um, publishing announcements compiled from the internet, Publishers Weekly, Twitter, um, and other social media. Um, thanks always to Rira for putting this list together. So let's get started. What is our first book deal? So our first book deal is Green Willow Bought Four Books by Newbery medalist Aaron Entrada Kelly, the author of Hello Universe. Uh, the first book is a middle grade novel called The First State of Being, and it's about a time traveling teenager from the future who gets trapped in Delaware in 1999 and befriends a lonely 12 year old boy changing the course of their lives forever. And the publication is set for 2024. Uh, Aaron Entrada Kelly also sold a new series titled Frankly Felix, and it's illustrated by herself. Um, 
And the first two books in the series introduce Felix Powell, an eight-year-old boy who shapeshifts into everyday animals, starting with a dog. And the final book that got picked up in this book deal is the fourth Marisol Rainey book. And there is no publication date set. Wow, that's like a whole gamut of cool things that my middle school self would have loved reading. Um, always love a good time travel book. Delaware in 1999 seems awfully specific, but I'm, I'm sure um, she probably has some connection to that time and place. Um, the Frankly Phoenix series reminds me of like, it reminds me of two things. It reminds me of Animorphs, which I don't know if you grew up with, which is a series about shape-shifting teens who can turn into animals. Um, and also um, that Nickelodeon series, Andy Mac, where it's like a girl can like turn into like goo. I'm familiar with Animorphs. I'm not <laughs> familiar with, with the latter. Mm. But yeah, Delaware in 1999. Um, yeah, I wonder what the specific, why the specific year Um but congratulations to Erin and Trotta Kelly. Uh, she is a wonderful author. Hello Universe is a great book. So check that out. Yeah. All right. Our next deal. Um, Owl Kids acquired Samina Goes to a Wedding, a picture book by author illustrator Farida Zaman. Um, when Samina visits Bangladesh for the first time in order to attend Auntie Yasmin's wedding, she enjoys activities and traditions with her extended family that give her a new understanding of her culture. Publication is set for spring 2026. You know, there's no better way to, like, have cultural pride than at a wedding when everyone's, like, just celebrating everything, right? Yeah, and, you know, South Asian weddings, Bengali weddings, they're uh, very different from a lot of, like, East Asian weddings. They are very long, very colorful. Uh, lots of festivities are lined up. I've never been invited to one, but I really <laughs> want to just to experience the grandeur. That being said, as someone who planned a small wedding reception last month, I'm glad that I didn't need to plan a grand event for when I got married. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know how Asian families are. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, like you, like I remember, um, I went to my cousin's wedding in Korea a couple of years ago, and it was it was a very weird experience because it was my first time going to a modern Korean wedding, and it's like it takes place in like those wedding halls, kind of like a yeah, it's kind of like a conveyor belt. But after the uh, after their wedding, um, like someone that I didn't even know, I think they knew my dad, but they were like, "Oh, so we're invited to your wedding, right?" And I was just like, "I don't." I don't even know you. Like, why? Like, why would I invite you? But that's just the thing with a lot of Asian wed weddings. They, your family, pretty much invites yeah. their friends, and you're like, "This is my wedding. Why? Why are there like a thousand people <laughs> showing up?" Oh, all right, all right. So next up, Simon and Schuster acquired at auction the Pink Pajamas, a picture book written and illustrated by 2023 Stonewall Book Award winning illustrator Char Charlene Chua, the author of Love Violet. Ling Ling's Ayi, her aunt, says I love you with her sewing, though Ling Ling isn't impressed by her latest pajamas. They're pink. But when Ai passes away and Ling Ling is left wearing store-bought pajamas in place of her beloved handmade ones, she realizes even pajamas in her least favorite color are a loving piece of Ai. Publication is planned for summer 2025. Yo, this story got dark. It's I know, it got <laughs> <What>? so sad. <laughs> for a picture book? What? I thought it was going to be a story about like, you know, like she gets the pajamas and it's like, oh, like, like, it's okay. Pink is, pink is still a... A great color and learning <laughs> how to appreciate things that, you know, your your family gives you. But wow, um, yeah. her her aunt dies. That <laughs> Yeah, it became like a dealing with grief and regret story, which I guess it's also important to teach children. It's just, man, it's, it's, it's just I didn't expect that from a <laughs> from a picture book titled The Pink Pajamas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> Congrats, Charlene. You got us. <laughs> um, all right. Our next book deal. Random House bought world rights to Lan Cham's Perfect is Not Perfect, in which Mao Mao, a perfectionist panda, tries to teach his messy classmate Olivia how to be perfect too. But when his plans go awry, Mao Mao wonders if perhaps there is something special hidden in imperfection. Publication is slated for summer 2025. 
Man, this is a book that I needed when I was a kid. I <laughs> I mean, I still am a perfectionist. Marvin knows. I get very anxious when things are not like yeah, like perfectly arranged. And I was the kid who drew outside the lines, so you would have driven me crazy. If we're we definitely your mama and I'm younger. Olivia, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> but I feel like as I've gotten older, I've learned to be like more chill with yeah. my per- perfectionism. I I feel like you you're kind of forced here as you grow up. But it's been nice because um I remember like at my old job I would work with a lot of kids and um we did a lot of crafts and uh, I would notice that like a lot of Asian kids, they, they had like the same tendency of like being perfectionists <laughs> and they'll be like, oh, my God, I messed up. Like, can I get like new materials to start over? And, you know, I would say as an adult, it's OK if you make a mistake, we can make it into something beautiful and something new. And um, I feel like this book is definitely something that younger readers, you know, would need. Yeah. All right. Next up, in an exclusive submission, HarperCollins acquired world rights to A City Full of Santas by Joanna Ho, the author of Eyes That Kiss in the Corners, and illustrated by Tai Fong. An Asian girl and her mother go to the city to meet Santa, and at first she is thrilled to find Santas all over the city. But none of them seems to be quite right. How will she find the real Santa? Publication is set for fall 2024. Oh no, it's the true coming of age story of realizing mm. Santa is fake. Santa is not real. Isn't there an event where there's, is it like a Santa marathon where there there's like is. a bunch of people? I want to say Santa? it's, hold on, I could Google this. We have Google exists, huh? Santa marathon. Oh, there's multiple ones. Oh, there's multiple. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I would not want to run 5K to like 26 miles in a Santa suit. That sounds horrible, but you know. I don't want to yuck other people's yum. Some people are into that. Some people, you know, it's probably really good for your fitness, I guess. I'm just wondering if this Asian girl is is just like, I thought Santa was Asian. How come none of these Santas are, are Asian? <laughs> I'm just wondering, maybe this is my own projection, but like, I feel like Asian kids, the magic is broken pretty quickly. Um, I don't know many, like, at, at least immigrant parents who want to keep the magic alive um, and letting some like old white dude take credit for their presence i i will give my parents credit uh they did keep the magic alive for quite a while until like maybe i was like 10 years old so brava to them however they completely gave up with my baby brother (laughs) they were like we're too we're too old for this like he can and also like uh, he's not much of like a a gift person Mm. so so they're just like what do we get him i don't know i guess like candy (laughs) yeah yeah, well, this story sounds super cute. So congrats to uh, to Joanna and to Ty on the book deal. Uh, next up, FSG bought world rights to Stay Angry, Little Girl, illustrated by Michelle Jing Chan. Inspired by the famous quote from Madeline Langle's A Wrinkle in Time. Stay angry, little Meg, Mrs. What's It whispered. You will need all your anger now, which aims to empower girls to embrace their less popular but just as valid emotions. Publication is planned for summer 2024. Yeah, always love a book embracing righteous anger. Um, just don't let it turn to toxic anger. But if it's righteous, I think it's fine. <laughs> I mean, like for girls, we're always told to behave and that like, you know, we have to suppress a lot of our emotions, be subservient, uh, be docile. So a lot of the times our anger gets buried and, you know, it kind of simmers there under our skin. It's... It's a whole thing. It's a whole brand. Angry Asian women, angry <laughs> Asian girls uh, for for a reason. So um, I'm really glad that this book is teaching younger girls that, you know, you're allowed to be angry and you're allowed to express that. It's valid. Yeah. All right. Next up, Walker Books U.S. bought at auction. World English rights to The Library is Open by drag superstar and RuPaul's Drag Race alum, Kim Chi, and Stephen Lee, the author of K-Pop Confidential. The middle grade novel tells the story of a queer Korean American's plight to save his beloved local library after learning it is set to be demolished to make room for a swanky new mall. And it is a two book deal with six figures and the publication is planned for 2025. Yeah, love that. It's a um, 
save the community center uh, type story, except now it's save the library. Yes, to a queer Korean American as the protagonist. Yeah. And libraries have served as safe spaces for a lot of marginalized communities. So uh, I'm really glad that you have a storyline about someone who is trying to protect that safe haven for marginalized um, marginalized voices and, and communities. All right. Um, next up, Viking bought at auction Amber Chen's YA silk punk fantasy of Jade and Dragons. Inspired by Qing Dynasty history and the Chinese classic The Butterfly Lovers, it follows a girl who must disguise herself as a boy and enter the dangerous Engineer's Guild trials to unravel the mystery of her father's murder while aligning with a secretive prince with plans of his own. Publication is set for summer 2024. This sounds like a pretty cool, like, sea drama setup. Yeah, especially with the whole disguises herself as a boy <laughs> part. That is a very sea drama element. Yeah. And I, I always love the term silk punk, which I think was coined by, for Ken Liu's um, Grace of Kings books to describe like Chinese inspired fantasy. Um, I think it's really cool to see like more people play in this space. Yeah, but I also heard that Ken Liu regrets coining that term <laughs> because it's brought a lot of uh, stereotypes in uh, publishing. And, you know, I feel like it was needed when Grace of Kings first came out and we did need a term for Asian-inspired fantasies, specifically like Chinese dynastic-inspired <laughs> fantasies. But the genre has broadened and we don't really need that as a crutch anymore. But yeah. silk punk, I mean, it still we know sounds what it cool. Is. It, sounds it still cool. sounds cool. <laughs> All right, next up, Clarion acquired Tracy Badua's next two middle grade titles, Thea and the Mischief Makers. And it's about a girl who accidentally provokes the revenge of two grumpy duendes after wrecking their home in a tree in her backyard. And she must team up with her friends to fend off the havoc wreaking goblins. And the second title, Airbnb, Boo, is about a boy who must figure out a decades-old mystery before the ghost haunting his family's summer vacation rental takes over his body to enact revenge. Publication is set for fall 2024 and 2025. This just, this sounds like Filipino-inspired, like, goosebumps. Uh, and I, I love it. Um, the first book sounds a lot like Gremlins, but instead of like Mogwai, now you have like Filipino goblins. And the ghost haunting the Airbnb is like a classic like Goosebump style story that I used to love reading as a kid as well. Have you ever been to like a haunted house or haunted uh, Airbnb? I mean, I've stayed at the Hotel Coronado in San Diego, which supposedly is haunted by a ghost, but um, not a haunted house per se, unless it's like a converted high school gym uh i lived in a haunted house i think i i've mentioned this in in a previous episode but yeah it's not fun <laughs> <laughs> so really uh a kid who has to like solve a what i'm guessing is like a murder mystery because it's a ghost haunting his family's summer home so someone must have died that's yeah. a lot of burden to put on a boy <laughs> <laughs> definitely like a gothic like something definitely definitely happened to this house a long time ago and and we must solve it or else I, I lose my body, which, you know, those are those are stakes. I mean, brava, because um my family was just like, we're moving. <laughs> <laughs> like we're we're not gonna dig into this house history and like look up like who died. <laughs> like, no, that's what white people do in horror movies. We're not doing that. <laughs> All right, next up, Random House Studio acquired The Cliff House by Guo Jing, a depiction of empathy, resilience, and environmental consciousness in which a growing family's small acts of kindness are returned with unexpected love in their moment of greatest need. Publication is scheduled for summer 2025. Not a lot of information, but definitely some good um, lessons, right? Like to treat others with kindness, to treat the environment with consciousness. I mean, I'm getting picture book vibes, but again, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, it sounds like a worthwhile book to give to young people. Yeah, yeah. Also, like environmental consciousness. Like I love the fact that younger people these days are more environmentally <laughs> conscious and, you know, like, 
us as millennials, I feel like that lesson was taught way too late for us. <laughs> so um, great that we are getting that more in uh, younger reader books. Yeah. Okay, so next up, in an exclusive submission, Workman Kids acquired the ABCs of Queer History, written by journalist and poet Seema Yasmin and illustrated by Lucy Kirk. The book depicts a journey through key individuals, movements, and moments across a range of identities and experiences. Publication is scheduled for spring 2024. Yeah. Again, um, we mentioned this in a conversation um, with Uzma Jalaluddin, who you will not hear for another few weeks, I guess. But we talked about how, you know, the the books that we read growing up has a profound um, effect on how we develop, how we think about things. And, you know, we've always said exposing kids to more varied experiences and point of views and histories um, will only make them better, more well-rounded people. As, as adults. So it's super cool that we have more books like this to give to our kids to learn about the world. Very true. <laughs> All right. Our next deal, HarperCollins bought three books in the Wolf Girl series, uh, which are illustrated middle grade adventures by Australian comedian and author Ando. When disaster separates Gwen from her family, she must fend for herself all alone in the wilderness. When a wolf puppy, a Labrador, a Chihuahua, and a Greyhound come to her aid, Gwen discovers talents she didn't know she possessed. Publication for the book is set for winter 2025. So the title of the series is called Wolf Girls. So I am wondering if it's uh, if it's kind of like an Eliza Thornberry situation where she's able to communicate with uh, like wolves and, and dogs. Yeah, I'm more struck by the makeup of her canine, like I guess, team which involves a wolf puppy, a Labrador, and a chihuahua. Um, that, and a greyhound. And a greyhound. That, that is a very, um, that's a very interesting picture to paint. And um, I'm kind of glad that it's an illustri- illustrated book. Uh, so we can see this like super team of, of dogs and puppies. But also, like, what are what is a Labrador, a Chihuahua, and a Greyhound doing in the wilderness? Like, are they like stray dogs? Are like like I can understand a wolf, but <laughs> curiouser and curiouser. I guess we'll find out. Yeah. All right. Next up, in an exclusive submission, Inkyard Press acquired in a six-figure deal Anne Liang's "I Could Give You the Moon," in which the darling socialite at an elite Beijing boarding school must outsmart the mysterious new student after discovering a vision of both their futures, one where she loses everything and he recovers everything he's lost, even as she fights her growing attraction to the enemy. Publication is slated for winter 2026. This sounds this sounds like a book you would enjoy, Rira. I know An Liang uh, is the author of If You Could See the Sun, which also takes place in a boarding school in Beijing. That's also like, you know, very like gossip girly. But An Liang's book, uh, it sounds like it's kind of like um, That's So Raven, where <laughs> where she's a- where the main character is able to see the future and um, she wants to change it. I wonder how the, um, I guess, like, time paradox will work in this book. That's always a fun part of reading books that are about future visions yeah. and, and I all mean, that. The interplay between fate and determination. There's a lot of things that the book can explore. And I guess congrats to Anne um, on the book deal. Um, all right, next up, HarperCollins' Quiltree Books bought Caging by Lydia King. The YA contemporary novel follows a Korean-American Nebraskan teen who, frustrated that everyone seems to know more about Korean culture than she does, attempts a self-guided crash course in K-pop, K-dramas, K-beauty, and more before her little brother is born. Publication is planned for fall 2025. Yeah, I have so many feelings right now. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, yeah, it's a weird feeling of just now as an adult seeing how embraced Korean pop culture and Korean beauty has become because that was not the case for me growing up. I mean, even like the cool Korean kids at school, they like liking Korean music was kind of seen as like second rate, you know? So yeah, it's like I have complicated feelings now seeing like 
uh, non-Korean people, non-Asian people try to uh, educate me on <laughs> on social media, on like culture. And I'm like, you didn't grow up in that culture. Why are you trying to school me? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've seen like other Korean Americans who maybe grew up in those situations try to get a crash course through watching K-pop, Korean dramas and like Korean variety shows. And, you know, <laughs> I think, you know, there's something to be said about like Korean culture as is marketed to the world and like Korean culture that is like lived in, I guess. Um, yeah, it's completely different. I do not <laughs> recommend people giving themselves like crash courses in <laughs> Korean culture through Korean media because really, I mean, think about it. Like, do we give crash courses in American culture by just showing people friends? And like America's next top model, like, of course not. You're not going to like <laughs> absorb your it's not representative of an entire country, an entire like culture. So, yeah, yeah. Lots of feelings. Um, <laughs> I'm very interested in reading this one. Yes. Yeah. All right. Next up, Little Brown's imprint, Ottaviano's bought in an exclusive submission, World Rights to Some of Us, A Story of Citizenship and America by Newbery Honor author Rajani LaRocca. Illustrated by Hui Von Lee, the picture book explores the unique paths to U.S. citizenship through naturalization. Publication is slated for summer 2025. <laughs> About that. Um, maybe I should read I didn't this get book my citizenship too. until I didn't get my citizenship until I was like 20, 21. <laughs> I still have not gotten my citizenship holding on to the Canadian citizenship for as long as I possibly can. I actually just renewed my green card. So I got a good 10 years before I need to uh, think about this again. Yeah, it was it was really irritating because uh, my parents applied for citizenship like right when I turned what, like 18. And I'm like, why? <laughs> why couldn't you have done it earlier? So I don't have to like go through it oh. by myself. So uh, yeah, but I remember like when I went for my citizenship test, um, like I helped other people like study their uh, study their like questionnaires because they make you like like answer random questions about America like how many states we have and what are three major rivers in <laughs> in this country and obviously if you didn't go to school in America like those questions are kind of arbitrary <laughs> i feel like the rivers one even if you did go to school you would have trouble like there's colorado mississippi Hudson? Does that count? I don't know if Hudson is a major... <laughs> the Los Angeles River. <laughs> That's a Okay. Uh, yeah, we suck at geography, which, <laughs> you know, tracks with Americans, I, I believe. I, I was educated here, so I can't blame Canada on that. No. no. <laughs> if I were to look at this cynically, this sounds like a book to teach kids how to explain their parents how to naturalize. I mean, it is it is a very long, tedious process. <laughs> and... Obviously, not a lot of people have that privilege either of yeah. naturalization. Comes with a lot of conditions. Um, moving on to our last deal. Um, Beaming Books acquired world rights to Ping's Perfect Pot, written by Helen H. Wu, um, the author of Tofu Takes Time, and illustrated by Zihua Yang. In this story of persistence and not giving up, a girl tries to make the perfect pot for the tangerine tree she and her grandfather purchased for Lunar New Year. Publication is scheduled for December 2024. I'm actually not familiar with the tangerine tree tradition. Um, it is might it not a tradition? Be, I'm not sure. It might not be my specific flavor of Chinese, but um, I'm assuming it is a... You know what? We can Google this. Like I mentioned before, Google exists. Tangerine tree, Lunar New Year. Let's see what Lunar New up. Year. <laughs> Asian culture is not a monolith, everyone. This is proof. We don't know everything about our own cultures. Um, yeah, apparently it is a a Chinese tradition. You know, the thing about being the child of immigrants is they don't explain things to you. You just do what your parents tell you because um, much yep. much in the same way that Asian parents don't use recipes. So there's nothing to pass on. Um, you kind of just have to learn through osmosis and um, like us, discover the context through Google because that is the Asian American experience. Yeah. But that's why books like this is important. So the kids can learn the context behind traditions um, and don't turn out like me. Don't turn out like Marvin, everyone. 
<laughs> right? Well, that'll do it for our book deals uh, for May 2023. Uh, moving on to our book news segment, uh, we have a couple of news, but I guess none more important than um, explaining what Bigless Dickless is to me. Yes. Okay. So I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> like when we were at the uh, when we were at the Fab uh, Long Beach Book Festival, uh, I had mentioned Bigolus Dickolus uh, to our author friends, and Marvin just looked so confused. And I was like, "Okay, we are going to explain this in our mid month episode." And I'm kind of sad that we're recording this episode a week late because it would have been like it would have made more sense. Uh, last week when it was like happening but <laughs> anyway so Bigolus Dickolus so this has got to be one of the best things Twitter has produced in the last like five years so on May 8th a Trigun fan account at Mask of Bun whose display name is Bigolus Dickolus Wolfwood tweeted that everyone should immediately read This Is How You Lose the Time War, which is a queer dystopian time novel, um, which is a queer dystopian time travel novella by Amal L. Matar, by Amal L. Matar and Max Gladstone. And this book was published back in 2019. So it is not a new yeah, book. Yeah, I've heard this book. I-, I think they read it on um, Sword and Laser uh, a couple years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, Anyway, the tweet goes, read this, do not look up anything about it, just read it, it's only like 200 pages, you can download it on, download it on Audible, it's only like four hours, do it right now, I'm very extremely serious. And then underneath there's a new tweet saying, grabs you personally by the throat, you will do this for me, you will go to the counter at Barnes & Noble, you will buy this, I will be greatly rewarded. So there's no link to the book either. It was just <laughs> a, it was a Trigun fan fan account that was just like, this is a really good book, and I'm just gonna recommend it, even though it has nothing to do with the anime. And the tweet went viral. I I don't know how, but it's one of those things where uh, random things go viral. But it went viral, and the book went up to like number three on Amazon. So it's not number three in sci-fi or like novellas. No, it is like the third best-selling book of all books on Amazon. That's quite a big deal considering that this book came out four years ago. And um, it was never named a New York Times bestseller until this happened. Until the (laughs) Bigolus Dickolus happened. Um, And... You know, bookstores big bookstores started to like print out their own as recommended by Bigolus Dickolus stickers. You know, like those stickers that they put on books being like Oprah's book club pick or Pulitzer Prize winner. Um, so like bookstores have been doing that and it's been like really hilarious. Um, there's also been like a bunch of anime cosplayers who have cosplayed as um Wolfwood. Gee, what was his Nicholas Wolfwood. Nicholas. Yeah. yeah. The guy with the giant yeah, cross been gun a lot- from Trigon. I know yeah, been who Wolfwood is, and I hate that I know. I don't hate that. I'm actually pretty proud that I know the the inspiration behind the screen name. But it is pretty funny. Because well, I yeah, imagine that but, guy does uh, have that guy does have some big dick energy, right? Yes, that's exactly why uh, it's named Bigolus Dickolus. <laughs> but um, a lot of anime cosplayers have been cosplaying as Nicholas um, Wolfwood with them reading... Um, this is how you lose the time war. So it's just been like this weird, like <laughs> wonderful, uh, like mashup of, of like nerddoms. And it's been so great. Um, the authors, obviously, they were like, what is happening? <laughs> like, who is Bigolus Dickolus? Why is my book doing so well after like years of it coming out? <laughs> I want to say the author's probably familiar with Trigun because Trigun, or at least I can see why Trigun no, fans would be excited about. No, a lot of people are not familiar about. with Trigun. Really? Though. Maybe it's just yeah, yeah. Really? I mean, a lot of people are not familiar with Trigun, but now nowadays they are because there's a reboot that came well, out. Well, the original and series played on like Toonami, right? Yeah, I mean, it did, but that doesn't mean that people are like fam- like people know what Trigun is. Okay, like when I was looking up. Uh, when I was following this news, pe- like a lot of people were like, "What's Trigun?" I guess it's an anime. So, wow, a lot of people don't 
didn't know what it was. Um, People my age, but probably know. But you know, but like uh, one funny thing that happened from this was you know how like when tweets go viral, people are like, "Oh, here's a link to my SoundCloud or whatever." Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, they like tag their their thing. So uh, Bigolus Dickolus, what they what they did was. Um, they added a Dark Horse Comics, who is the publisher of uh, the Trigun mangas, uh-huh. and was like, yo, Dark Horse, can you like re-release the Trigun uh, mangas? Because they're like out of print. I would love to read the original. And literally like a couple days later, Dark Horse was like, yeah, like it's coming out. And I'm like, was this already in the works or was it spurred <laughs> by Bigolus Dickolus? Oh. Um, so it's been it's been just like really joyful to see the publishing community just, you know, come to life. Um, because like, I don't know, like I feel like with TikTok and book Twitter, speaking as a book fluencer myself, um, it's really hard to, you know, not be cynical about book recommendations these days because it's just like, oh, is it actually like a good book? Um, because, you know, they're book fluencers. They they get arcs. Like, is this something that they're actually interested in reading? Is this something that they would actually recommend? So to have like a random person on the internet be like, buy this book, read it right now. I will grab you in a chokehold <laughs> until you do. It There's like an enthusiasm to it that, you know, we've, kind of lost in the book community <laughs> yeah i mean it's the type of energy you get from like these anime fan accounts because they're all very passionate about their their favorite shows and their tropes that being said have you watched the new trigun series yet i have not but i really want to because the old trigun series um i haven't watched the entire series but the art was really i guess rustic for me I mean, and it was really like hard for me to 20, get into 30 year old anime at this point i feel like but um i really it's one of those shows that starts off fun and then gets really serious halfway through um which you know you know me i love a good like feel bad um (laughs) type of like grim dark excellent um series um this new series i have not watched it yet but the animation looks pretty good usually like these cg animes look like trash but this one actually looks really really good so Um, Yeah, 3D animation has gone a long way when it comes to, like, uh, merging with 2D animation. And, you know, like, I felt the same way with Fruits Basket because (laughs) I had not read or watched Fruits Basket. Like, I could not do it when the original series was running because I was like, oh, I can't do it. The art, it's just, I, like, can't. (laughs) And then the reboot came out and the animation is beautiful. And I was like, yes, I can finally consume this media <laughs> after over 10 years of its uh of its original release yeah. so thank you bigless dickless for bringing trigun back <laughs> into the spotlight yeah <laughs> all right um our next story rira i need to tell me about this bts book okay so um so BTS has an oral history book called Beyond the Story, 10-Year Record of BTS, which is coming out on July 9th from Flatiron Books. And the reason why this is like on our radar, other than the fact that this is a BTS <laughs> book and I'm an army, is the fact that publishing Twitter didn't know like what celebrity it was. So so like it so there was like rumors being like, oh, there's like a big celebrity memoir that's gonna have one million copies in its initial print and it's coming out July 9th and the announcement for the title is coming out June 13th. So a lot of like a lot of fandoms were like, oh, it's it's like it's our celebrities book. <laughs> it's Harry Styles book. But um Like, one big contender was Taylor Swift. A lot of Swifties thought that it was her book because 13 is her favorite number and it shows in, like, her albums. And July 9th, the book's publication date, it falls two days after the release of her upcoming album, Speak Now. And um, ARMYs, BTS fans, we were like, this is a BTS book. I know it. I feel it in my bones. It's because BTS's anniversary is June 13th, which is the date that the uh, title and subject was announced. Uh, I think by Variety. I think Variety was the uh, exclusive 
release. I don't, I, I don't remember, but um, and July 9th, 2023 is the 10th anniversary of um, ARMY fandom. So that was when BTS's fandom got its name. And it was just so funny to me because so many people on Asian American book Twitter are BTS fans. And all of us were like, it's a BTS book. I know it. I know it's a BTS book. Uh, Jun Seal Tan, the author of Jade Fire Gold, <laughs> she and I were just like, it's like, it, it, it's BTS. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it's BTS. We've got to pre-order the book <laughs> right away. One million copies is not enough because... Random people are going to just be like, oh, it's a BTS book. We need to buy it. Um, so I pre-ordered it, naturally. Um, yeah. it's It was $45, and I'm like, wow, this book is real expensive. I hope it comes with high-quality photos because, um, you know, like having a $45 hardcover book, not everyone can afford that. And um, I don't know. It was a very impulsive decision. I mean, it'll on, look on great part. on your coffee table or bookshelf. You know, it's a it's, nice. It's going to be on like a freaking glass <laughs> display somewhere in my apartment. <laughs> um, but the book is written by journalist Myung Seok Kang with the seven members of BTS. And it, like I said, it's oral history. So it will be structured in um, oral history. I'm guessing that. There's going to be like, like transcripts and stuff like transcripts yeah. and stuff. Um, and it's been translated into English by Anton Her. Yeah. Former Anton books Her, and Boba guest our... Anton Her. Yeah. <laughs> so technically we're connected to this book. It's just it's so funny to me because Anton Her, the translator for um, I Want to Die But Eat Tteokbokki, that's a book that was recommended by RM, the leader of BTS. And because he recommended it, that book went viral and became like a bestseller. So Anton has kind of been um, in like adjacent to, I guess, BTS content. <laughs> and now... Um, He's like directly involved. Yeah. And it's funny because I've seen Anton like some of my BTS tweets. <laughs> and I'm like, are, are you one of us? <laughs> like, <laughs> Pro- like, probably. I'd, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I mean, is there anybody who's anti BTS? Like, I think oh, most people yeah. are. There's a ton of people who are. Really? Um, like, there's, actively yeah, there's anti? Because I can see being indifferent. Yeah, actively anti. Wow. Like, this, was, this is not an easy fandom, okay? <laughs> like, it is a lifestyle. And there was a lot of hate. There still is a lot of hate. But I digress. Uh, but speculation about the book made it a bestseller immediately on Amazon and Barnes and Noble because people were like, what is this book? Is this a Taylor Swift book? Is this a Harry Styles book? Is this a BTS book? I don't know. I'm just going to pre-order it right now because wait, so you can pre-order it not before enough. it was announced or before the actual, like how did that, work? I don't remember actually. It kind of is a fever dream. Uh, I just I remember. I mean, I can see this book instantly like, shooting up to number one anyways, by virtue of being the BTS book. So um, I guess it's not surprising that it made number one without even like pre-release. Um, I mean, people already knew that it was going to be big. I mean, Flatiron said the initial run is going to be one million copies. And I'm like, who gets one million copies these <laughs> days in their first like first editions? You know, yeah. like paper is super expensive now. Like we have a whole like paper production uh, crisis in publishing, which is kind of like on the download. They don't want you to know, Oof. but there's some issues with paper production. <laughs> yeah. Well, happy for all you army people. Am I using that armies. correctly? Armies. Armies. <laughs> happy for all you armies. Um, adorable representatives of uh, <laughs> a- adorable representative MCs for youth. Yes. Yeah, is that yeah that's is, that's is like an hot acronym for sure <laughs> oh hot bringing it back all the way to 1998 marvin <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's all all i know is it stands for high five of teenagers that is true that yeah. is true all right um we have one more story which is um american board chinese premieres wednesday may 24th which is yesterday tomorrow for us tomorrow for us yesterday for all you um listeners um on disney plus um Based on Jin Luen Yang's 20, 2006 graphic novel of the same name, the series centers on Jin Wang, a high schooler struggling with his school and home life, who meets Wei Chen, the new Taiwanese exchange student, at his school. However, a sequence of events lead him to become involved in a battle between gods of Chinese mythology. 
Um, I'm actually really excited about this series. Um, all the initial buzz have been very positive, and I've watched a couple of the trailers, and it's interesting what they're doing with this series. Because as someone who has read the original graphic novel, there are some things there where I was like, how are they going to adapt this? And how are they going to make this not like, how are they going to adapt this for like television? Because there's some things in that book, certain themes that are really hard to depict. So um, it's kind of cool that they're focusing on the um, martial arts, mythical gods aspect of it. What are your thoughts on, on the show so far? I mean, I have not watched any trailers um, and I've never read the graphic novel, mm. but it is a star studded cast. I mean, Michelle Yeoh and Kate Kwan, uh, just every like I'm looking at the cast list, uh, Leonard Wu, Jimmy O. Yang. It's just and Stephanie Sue. Like, I'm really glad that this is coming at the heels of like so many other uh, Asian American shows. I mean, like. Exo Kitty just came out like last week. Yeah. So um yeah, I'm excited. I I want to watch it before I read the graphic novel so that I don't have that uh preconception of the story. Yeah, and you know, I'd love to talk with you about this at some point, either on the show or for a Patreon exclusive. Um, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts as someone who watched the show before reading the graphic novel because I'm obviously coming in from the opposite end. Also, I have to... Okay, this is a sidebar, but I saw Jean Luen Yang at your wedding reception, and I was like, what is he doing? I was like, what is he doing here? How is he here? How does Marvin know him? He wasn't at my wedding reception. Wasn't wasn't he? Like, I'm my pretty sure he was. My friend Eugene looks exactly like him, but he's not him. Okay. I know who you're talking okay, about. He's Yeah, all right. <laughs> Okay, so I like <laughs> doppelganger. I was like really confused. I wish I, I knew Jean Luen Yang, right? But, no, that's that's my high school friend Eugene. He is. Um, he definitely has um, Jean Luen Yang vibes. Um, one thing on that note, though, one thing that I'm really excited to keep an eye out for is um, one of my good friends from high school is actually a location scout for the show, and I know for a fact that there are several locations in American Born Chinese that is filmed in San Gabriel, Alhambra, Rosemead. And I, I will be on the lookout for those those sites because it's always cool to see like places you grew up in on TV. Very authentic. Yeah. Authentically Chinese American locations. Well, that was it for our news segment. Yeah. As always, if there's anything that we missed or anything that you want to bring to our attention, um, please let us know um, both on Goodreads or if you are a Patreon subscriber um, on our Discord. We always love to hear from our listeners and, you know, trying to make that Discord a more lively place for everybody. Um, but before we go, um, Rira, can you remind us what we are reading for the month of May? So we are reading The Fortunes of Jaded Women by Carolyn Huynh. And it is a contemporary novel about a Vietnamese American family in Southern California who deal with the fallout of an ancient curse. Um, a very yeah, petty so curse, it, too. Was... A very petty <laughs> curse, yes. I mean, it's an it's an Asian curse. So yeah, it's all petty. Like, do we, yeah, it's all petty. <laughs> Yeah, excited to discuss that book with you, Rira, at the end of the month. And as always, if you finish the book and have any thoughts, you can share with us on both Goodreads or our Discord servers. We always love including your thoughts in our book club discussions. Well, with that, that'll do it for our mid-month check-in for Asian Pacific American Heritage Month 2023. Um, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks for listening to Books and Boba. This podcast was hosted by Marvin Yue and Rira Yu and edited and produced by Marvin Yue. Follow the book club on Twitter and Instagram by going to at Books and Boba and engage with us on Goodreads on our Goodreads group. You can also check out past episodes of the podcast by going to booksandboba.com and by subscribing to us on your favorite podcast app. Don't forget, you can support Books and Boba and Asian American authors by purchasing books at our bookshop.org account. Check out the link in our show notes and also at booksandboba.com. Books and Boba is a proud member of the Potluck Podcast Collective, a collective of Asian American hosted podcasts featuring unique voices and stories from the Asian diaspora. Learn more about the collective and check out our fellow Potluck shows by visiting the website podcastpotluck.com. Thanks for listening.
Hello, I'm Phil Yu, and I'm the host of All the Asians on Star Trek, the podcast in which I interview all the Asians on Star Trek. I'm talking to actors, writers, directors, stunt people, background extras. You know, all the Asians on Star Trek. Find out more at alltheasiansonstartrek.com. Part of the Potluck Podcast Collective. Live long and prosper.